Let's drop the green flag on this episode of the Talent Tank Podcast with your host, Wyatt Pemberton, bringing you the best, fastest, most knowledgeable personalities in Ultra 4 and off-road racing. Hey, it's Wyatt. Yes, asking for your help. If you like the show and enjoy the content, please hit the five-star rating on Apple Podcast or on Stitcher. Please consider writing a quick review on the Talent Tank Facebook page, on YouTube, and absolutely on Apple Podcasts. And consider joining the discussions in the Talent Tank Insiders group on Facebook. All right, let's get to it. Here we go. We are back in the Talent Tank. Man, everybody had Thanksgiving. We're back at it. You know, we've got Christmas right around the corner. We're, you know, in full prep mode for King of the Hammers, fitting in, getting in, getting everything done. And I'm no different. Still uh, still trying to wrap this up, get all these guys uh, in that you want to hear before we get to the new year when we start everything up again. And this part of a two-parter, I still don't know how it's going to work out with uh, episode labeling or whatever, but we're going to work it out. This is Tribe 16, Tribe 4 times 4, Tribe 4 by 4, the new Tribe 16. And we've got counterpart, you know, number one. We've got, you know, public enemy number one, Adam Shearer with us today. And this isn't pronounced Adam Shearer. -er -er. Adam Shearer. Adam, welcome to the show. I appreciate it, Wyatt. Thank you uh, so much for giving me the opportunity uh, to be on the show. But uh, just real quick, one thing. Ah, there we go. Much better. Ah, right, the, the, the cold one. Yeah. But is it a beer? It looks like a sparkling water from here. Uh, no, it's a, it's a deep LM IPA, local, uh, local beer that's brewed here out in Dallas. Man, I, I do absolutely, I mean, you've you know, found a way to my heart. I love craft beer, and I didn't know I did, but uh, yeah, I discovered it about 10 years ago and just absolutely love it. And you've got a guy that's uh, there local, one of the tribe tribe crew, one of the tribe clan, Clint Stapp. Yep. He is over there at, uh, well, he was at a, a, a brewery. Was that the first brewery he was at? Um, or, rabbit Hole. Rabbit it Hole. It was Rabbit Hole out, yeah, kind of out in the country. He uh, he was the brewmaster out there, and. And now he's working for Rar Brewery, um, Rar which is a Sons. yeah, Rar and Sons, a large brewery down in Fort Worth, and um, he's uh, he's heading up all their financial down there right now. And yeah, Clint's a great guy. He's an old school wheeler. He's been around forever, and, and we're lucky to call him a friend. And he actually lives two streets down from our new shop, which is that's a bonus because he's always stopping by and bringing us good, yummy, you know, Texas made beer, tasty, so, tasty love hops, it. tasty yes, hops and water, yes. love yeah. it. Well, uh, yeah, so now you've got a beer in your hand. We've got an Adam on the show. We're going to go into everything that is Tribe Tribe 16 and everything that makes Adam Shear the, you know, and the, the the brains that he is behind the operation. And, you know, you, he's been in business about t over 10 years now with the Tribe name. Yeah, a little, little over 10 years. Yep, 10 years. And cranking out race cars like nobody's business and, you know, in talking with Matt Howell, I was like, you know, I don't know how for me, so many years you did it without doing it with meth. Uh, yeah, we've had plenty of late nights and, you know, s struggle sessions. And yeah, it's, it's, yeah, we're, you know, a lot of long hours and a lot of devoted people and friends and, you know, that really want to come over and help, you know, help race prep and, you know, do the dirt stuff, the tire balls and you know, load trailers and out in the snow. And yeah, it's, we, I think we're pretty fortunate to have, you know, a lot of support behind the racing and, you know, to get it all done. Yeah. I don't think there's anyone that back when tire balls were legal, I don't think there was anyone out there that could strip a, a tire and wheel of tire balls and then replace it and redo it as fast as you guys were. I think you guys were even yeah. won some, one, like some swag or something from a uh, tire ball ink from Mark Harris over there, over your yeah. ability to uh, make it happen. Yeah. You know, good old off-road competition, you know, we got to, on the track and off, we gotta, you know, everybody's always trying to be the best. All right, so <laughs> I've got, I've got to, you know, set the hook here. Who is your favorite racer that runs a tribe car or has ran a tribe car in history? Who is your favorite racer? Number one, who is it? Rank him. I, I mean, I'd have to be Jason Shear. Uh, he's a badass. I mean, he, he was the the very first car we ever built. Um, he raced it for a short term, not, not too long, no white car, whitey, we called it. And, um, we, a long time ago, we put it together and he came out and he said he'd, he'd drive it for us. And I think he only raced it like 
three or four times maybe. And, and then it was sold off and we, that's when we started building the, uh, the single seat IFS car. And we had many, many highs and lows with him, with that car. And, um, you know, it was kind of a love hate relationship, but he taught us so much. And, and, you know, so I, he's, he's definitely my favorite. I know we're going to get deep into this later on in uh, the show, but I definitely want to talk about Sure and a couple of his cars. Old Whitey. Now, if I remember right, he showed up and he looked at that car and he said, this is not a race car. Yeah. Tell you. Oh, yeah. That was quite a, a letdown. Let's just Crushed like you. totally let the wind, wind out of your sails. Holy cow. Yeah. He, you know, you know, we're, we're young and we're new and learning things and we're excited about this car that we're building. And, and the sport was still young too. You know, everybody's still kind of on the rock donkeys and, and he came in and looked at the car and to sit in it and to, you know, do, you know, pedal placement and steering wheel placement. And, and that's the first thing he said. He came in, he goes, you know what, this is, this is not a competitive car. You know, this, this is not a competitive car. And we were just like, damn, that's, you know, holy cow. That's the, you know, thanks for saying that. Appreciate it. But thanks for the punch in the dick. The, the few times. Yeah. The, I mean, the, the few times he, that he drove it though, he drove the damn wheels off it. I mean, he was always out front and, and kicking butt and, you know, until it broke. From my perspective of what I saw out of Jason in that car was what we saw on Race Desert when I believe it was Texana Ranch. I believe it was at there in Blackwell, Texas. Um, Texana Ranch, the you know Beale family. I don't remember if it was like a like race to midnight or what the exact event was, but they had qualifying and one of the guys that was there uh, was in a, a Geyser Trophy truck. It was Jesse James. You know he's an Austin guy now, and he had uh, his Geyser out there. You know, the qualifying starts and Jason put that rock donkey out in front of a geyser truck. And that, you know, there was a, there was a lot of people on Race Desert that, you know, kind of called, hey, you know, it's a tight course. It's this and that. It's, you know, th- there was excuses made, but at the same time, eyes were open and going, crap. I mean, yep. that's uh, that th- they were able to put this solid axle front, solid axle rear r- rock rock crawler out in front of a geyser trophy truck at what was in theory supposed to be a desert race. So it was I don't know. There was that a whole was, bunch of us clapping behind the scenes. Yeah, that was a cool race that we really didn't get to race much. We uh, we did start on pole and we we pulled away. We were out, I think, mile marker 18 or something like that, and we lost the engine. We lost oil pressure and burned the motor up. And But it was, you know, it would have been a cool race. And then you guys did another car for Jason right after that, and that was the Wild West Fab front-end car that ultimately became the 321 Tom Way's orange car. It was probably yep. raced in that configuration for the longest time. And then now Mike, Mike Bow owns it. Correct. Yeah. Mike Bow owns it now. So it'll be yeah. back. It'll be back out at the hammers. Yeah. That car's, you know, what is that going on? Seven years old, eight years old now? Probably uh, eight, seven or eight years old. Still probably one of my favorite cars. It's a, I, you know, I always say I'd love to have the opportunity to build it again. Um, knowing now what we didn't know then and new technology and, and stuff like that to, you know, build another single seat, a little, small tight oh it's small you know, go-kart i think that's what's car. amazing yeah. about it i think uh, absolutely it's tiny what what do you what's it weigh or what did it weigh when we first built it we weighed it i do believe it was just over four i think it was 4200 pounds good lord that is, that is light yeah of course then you know we didn't have a spare tire we didn't have a jack we didn't have any of those tools you know all that extra stuff you got to have to have we were on tire balls you know, it was a little bit lighter and everything was on the, on the thin. So Jason, you know, when we built it, Jason, we, I'd, I'd build something and I'd send him a picture and he's like, can you make it lower? Can you make it smaller? You know, can you make it lighter? One of those things, you know, do we need all that? You know, just everything on the simple and on the, you know, on just totally weight shaving or, you know, center of gravity, keeping it low. He even wanted the GPS, you know, mounted damn near on his feet. <laughs> just I mean, to, but, just but that's cool all to have him down. challenge you guys, right? He's challenging oh, yeah, the build. Yeah. yeah. And that's what he learned from his, his first car that he won KOH in 2009 was, you know, center of gravity and, and keeping everything light um, and, and low. So we, we took a, we learned a lot of that and still build a lot of cars like that today. I'm trying to keep stuff low and uh, to where they perform a little bit better. Let's jump into this. How do how does Wyatt Pemberton know Adam Shearer? And I've thought back to this. I cannot remember when we first met in person. I, I uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I remember the. I'm sure it was in passings. You know, from all the different races we were at. I'm. I'm I know I saw you at um, one of the races up at Bill Baird's place. Um, what was his uh, his his race that he did up there? Battle of I the Bluegrass. Raced- was that what yeah, it was? Yeah, that was it. And you had your car. I remember seeing you up there. See, I think I, I knew you before then, but 
I, I definitely remember when you landed kind of on my radar, you had built a, well, it was just a chassis. You had done a chassis. You were working out of your garage, uh, this before, well before Tribe, and you had it on the old hardline crawlers forum, and it looked like an upside down canoe with lots of, you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and that, that car ended up being bought by a guy on Pirate 404 called uh, Laparoscopic. I don't, can't remember Laparoscop. his name. Laparoscopic. Yep, yep. He was a doctor or like a anesthesiologist in an ER or something like that. And it got built at Fabrication Unlimited. And then mm -hmm. did it ever race a King of the Hammers or it was out there? It was. It was. I remember seeing it out there. Um, I don't believe it. I'm not sure if it ever raced. though. I don't think it did. I really didn't see much, much ever happen with that car. It looked great when they when they finished it. And it, it was something completely different than what I originally started out as. It was just going to be a rock crawler, just a fun buggy. Yeah, I started that in the garage and and had some inspiration from the the aerial atom i think it was was that little kit car the little bitty which it had, i think it had a four cylinder in it it was kind of like a street car and with the big rolled tubes down the body lines of it and i, I saw that and kind of liked it and so that's where i started with some inspiration on shaping the body of it um was like that and then i only got so far and he wanted to buy it and yeah we were i was new into the shop and i needed money and you know to get the shop stuff going and so i sold it before i ever had a chance to finish it no, that was the first chassis that you had. I was like, man, who is this guy, this Adam Shearer? I was like, man, I should know this guy. We're all in Texas at the same time. I mean, granted, you guys are five hours away from me. But uh, like I said, I think I recall it being on hard line. Someone had shared the picture. Or maybe you had shared the picture yeah. of the chassis. I was like, wow, that is. Yeah, it was probably pirate too, yeah. It was just so out of the box. I mean, it did. It kind of looked like an upside down canoe. And it didn't have the, you know, the. I guess passenger compartment tube on it yet. I was like, man, it just made me, you know, stay up at night thinking about, <laughs> wow, that's so far out of the box. And then when I, that guy got it, all the changes he made to it to make it actually work. I got heckled. I got heckled a little bit from a handful of people. I think I don't know who 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 made fun of me, but the canoe. I, I a couple of times I was called a canoe and this and that. But yeah, no, I we came back from Hammers one year, early years, and. I saw some some cars there with rolled tubing in it, and you know every every year you come back from ha hammer with a, a fire underneath you, and you want to do all kinds of cool things and build this and build that. And on the on the drive home, I'm ordering tools off a of, you know I, off the internet. I'm, I ordered up a, a roll bender, a tubing roll bender, and and that's when it hit the door. I started rolling tube and started building that, and you know that's a lot of inspiration. Um, you know that that kind of that built that car. Whitey was one of those cars that had definitely had a rolled tube back out of it. I do remember that. That was yeah, quite, quite different. Yeah, I still have that tubing roller. It's tucked away in the corner with a, a nice layer of dust on it. I I try not to break it out. <laughs> they get used less and less and less. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Let's let's kind of get away from this. We've kind of got way way forward and way far into off road, and we've skipped kind of the mo of who Adam is, where Adam's from. Adam is a he's a Texas native, born raised, whole life. Love it. Loves. Loves barbecue I'm, and Bob Schneider that's it. and Lone Star beer. I'm proud Texan. Yeah, I'm a I'm a proud Texan. I love it. So I know you know I love Texas country music, kind of alternative country music. I know I have some of that in common with you in that uh, you've got some some favorite shows that you and your wife go hit, like Bob Schneider. Oh yeah, Bob Schneider. I uh, grew up with Ian Moore. He's from Austin. Um, you know, there's a, all kinds of like we love Red Dirt and you know music from Oklahoma and and you know all all, all kinds of stuff. Yeah, like the old cross Canadian ragweed. It's really sad those oh, guys yeah. broke up. Yeah, Turnpike, the Turnpike Troubadours, all, all, all good bands like that. Love it, man. If Cody Jinx will come to Houston when I'm here, I'm going. Like, uh, like that is between him and uh, like Whiskey Myers. Those two, oh, bo yeah. both those guys played. One played in Quero. Whiskey Myers played in Quero at Chili. Is it Chili Fest? Quero Fest. I don't know. It was October the twelfth. Let me just tell you that it was October the twelfth of this year. And Cody Jinx played at the Houston Horse Track same night. They're about, you know, two hour distance apart. And I live in Houston, so I should be like, no, we were in Kansas for, you know, seeing my family and missed both. I'm telling Tiffany the whole time. I'm like, we should have gone. Now my family in Kansas is going to listen to this and be like, what a bastard. Yeah. I've asked you this in the past and I, I don't remember the answer to it, but Bob Schneider has a moniker and I've, I've seen you say it. I've, I've seen you. Hell, I think you have a hat. Oh, and you're holding it up in front of me. It's a, uh, it's. F A Y M, and that stands for fame. But what is what's it mean? Uh, you know, there's a little some some vulgarity in there. I think it's for all y'all MFers. Is, for all y'all MFers, how it's deemed. For all y'all MFers. 
you know, everyone in the South that's listening to this uh, podcast is like, they're screaming into their radio right now going, no, it means this. I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's up for whoever's, you know, interpretation. Yeah. I saw, I saw Bob Schneider once probably Oh five Oh six and did not know who he was before. And then I got highly drunk and I've really, I'm, I'm not a good, I am not a good Bob Schneider fan. I'm, I like about everybody else in Texas country, but he's, he's not one of them, but I know he's one of your favorites. So you, yep. uh, being a Texas guy, you grew up Texas high school, you right there in that area though, South Lake. Yep. Yeah. I was, I was born and raised here in the, in the Dallas Fort Worth area, right in between or kind of right in the middle um, little town called South Lake. And back in the day, it was, you know, just not very populated pastures and some farmlands. And there was a couple of nice neighborhoods and it's, it's completely different now. It's track mansions and, you know, it's, it's just million dollar homes everywhere. It's pretty crazy. My dad still lives there in his little bitty, his little bitty house. And, you know, amongst all these, these million dollar mansions and stuff, it's kind of funny, but yeah, I, I grew up there and it was kind of nice, you know, we had some, a little bit of country life, you know, played out in the pastures and had all kinds of stuff, you know, BB guns and, and, you know, just kind of the country grow up. And then you moved to, to today you live in Hearst in which that's only yeah. a few miles from your new shop, right? Yeah, we live in Hearst. Um, we actually moved, I, you know, I, I've lived here all the way up until my late twenties and we moved to, uh, San Antonio for a few years and that's a quite a culture shock from, from up here and you go to San Antonio and it's uh, a little bit slower paced and we lived there. It was really nice. Um, and then we came back and, and so we've been here ever since now. And you say we, you, uh, your wife, Clarissa, and yes. you've got two, and you got two boys. Yep. Yep. I don't know anything about your boys, but your wife, she's a blast. She is so she's somebody who I love to party with. Like when, if there's an event going on and Clarissa is going to be there, I'm like, dude, I want to be there because she, she keeps it real. She does. She's something else. Uh, yeah, she's she's amazing person. Very, very fun. Yeah, she puts up with you. I mean, that's that's number one. <laughs> or maybe she, you put up with her. I don't know. No, no. She puts up with me and, and, the, and the crazy lifestyle we live. And, you know, all the time we put in here at the shop, she really she really takes up the slack that I that I slack off on with taking care of the kids and, you know, the family stuff. And she's she's on top of that. And I just I try to stay along and, and, you know, make it to events and this and that as much as I can. But it's, you know, running a shop and, and a race life schedule is it's tough, you know, trying to trying to do it all. Oh, and I thank you for working this in. I know the first the first night we scheduled this, you had a, one of your sons, his birthday. You kind of can't mar- miss a, mer- a birthday dinner. Can't do that. I've been no. I've been a bad one. And then yeah. uh, the second one is tonight you had a what a football banquet football banquet tonight. Yep. And I had to ditch out just a little early to, to make this. And I think anyone that listens to the Matt Howe version of this, uh, we also, we, he and I didn't have scheduling issues per se on making it happen. But what we had was with you, me driving all the way to Fort Worth to interview you guys in person a few weeks ago and just having it be a total failure. Amazing new shop. We got that. I got to hang out with you guys, have a few beers, you know, in person. You, there's nothing wrong Absolutely. with that. That's, that was an amazing time. You can come up here anytime. I do. I've, I've, you know, no called and just showed up so many times at uh, your old digs. Now you have a nicer place. I'm not worried about my car getting stolen or on blocks out front now. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll be there, but yeah, the, uh, your boys, they're, uh, they're heavy into boy scouts. I do know that. Yeah. Yeah. I've got, yeah. Two boys, uh, one's 15, Evan and, uh, one seventeen Aiden. And I, I tell you what, my wife, she just keeps them just constantly busy with stuff. They're, they're in the sports and, uh, and to, uh, uh, scouts and I mean, just everything, baseball, football. And, you know, she just, she's constantly got them doing something. Have you guys been to Philmont yet? No, um, actually we've got, uh, we're scheduled next year for our kids to, uh, to go to Philmont scout camp. Yep. Which is, uh, which is huge. That's, are you going? No, I'm, I'm not going to be able to make it. Um, oh. it's, uh, everything's all filled up. But it, I, I went when I was a kid, when I was in the Scouts, um, I, I had the opportunity to go to Philmont. And it was just amazing, you know, just to have that experience. And I'm, I'm super, super excited that, that they're going to be able to do the same thing I did, you know, some 30 years ago. Uh, that place is that place is magical. It's I almost put uh, Philmont on the same pedestal as Johnson Valley. Oh yeah, definitely. Like like, like for experience for experiences, man. I, I loved it. There's so much character building events that I can look back in my childhood and my youth that came out of find out who I was. You know, with a 75 pound pack strapped to my back in the middle of the oh, yeah. <laughs> New Mexico backcountry. 
Yeah, the best is pick, picking up rocks on the trail and, you know, putting them in your in your buddy's backpack in front of you. And, and you know, that's the joke. And just <laughs> the next keep, thing and just keep 10, 20 pounds heavier. Oh, yeah. Just just pranking people. So <laughs> speaking of, so one of the ways I know you we're going to this will be a tangent. So I have, you know, as everyone who's listened to any of this show knows that I've, you know, I really enjoy going sailing in the islands and. I've shared that experience. You know, I've gone on a trip with you guys, with you and your wife, and we like to boat prank each other, right? Back and forth, water balloons or uh, water balloon launchers or, you know, dead chickens or, you know, whatever that may be. And Chip McLaughlin and uh, Doug Jackson and 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 all those Clay guys, Gilchow. Clay, Clay, Clay uh, <laughs> but they're all down there right now and they're posting, you know, on social media. And so... Here I am. So they're going to get back and they're going to listen when they listen to this. And this is the point where my ass has had is I in giving Chip ideas. And one of the ideas is, at you know, when you're on the, the mooring ball, so there's the the ball floating there that's anchored to the bottom of the, the seabed. It's got a, a, an eyelet on it and you take the, the catamaran up to it and you run two ropes through it and they come back to each sponson of the uh of the front of the catamaran, you cleat them off. Well, at night when the other boat's asleep, you swim over like SEAL Team 40 plus with your duct tape. <laughs> and where the lines roll through the eyelet on the mooring ball, you duct tape up the line as it doubles back on itself and you duct tape them up, just wrap it all up in duct tape on both sides. So the next morning when you guys are already cast off, you know, the captain's up there, he's got the boats that, you know, the, both the diesels fired up and he's yelling down to the guys at the, on the bow to, Hey, undo, undo our mooring lines off the cleats and throw them. Right. And they throw them. And they don't go anywhere because they're duct taped up. That's not going to do any damage, but it's going to stall them for like multiple minutes going, eh, it's, it's duct taped up and they can't pull it through the eyelet. So then they're going to have to pull up on it, get a knife out, clean down there. So I, I shared that with Chip. So hopefully, t- hopefully today or yesterday they got Doug and Clay or, or Chris or uh, I'd be interested to hear their uh, what, what pranks they did. Because I did hear there was uh, some food or vegetables thrown at each other from boat to boat a couple of days ago. I think I think that was some of the best times. One of the highlights was when we did the the boat trip was the the silly little pranks that we did back and forth and the scheming and the blow up dolls and the you know the whipped cream and all kinds you know it was just very very creative and some, some of them were very they were very trying on the captains the boat captains were they were a little some of them were a little overboard and we had actually they had a they had to say no nah, y'all can't do that or you can't do this and you know I think at one time we were actually gonna go and snorkel over to the next boat and take the prop off off the, one of the engines with, you know, with the little bit of tools they give you. <laughs> oh my gosh. The that like, that, that you know, would have been hilarious. Yeah, you know, we, we'd be able to pull that one off, but you know, the captain wasn't too happy about that one. Yeah. I think you can spin the, uh, the wheel off the, you know, the, the captain's wheel, you can spin it off pretty easily and it, you, you could take that. That was, that was one that was the one that was thrown out there. Yeah. Oh man. Good stuff. But yeah, I think Terry Madden took a dinghy and hid somebody's dinghy on the other side of another boat. And the guys wake up the next day and they couldn't find their dinghy to get, you know, to cast off with or to get to shore or whatever it was. Good stuff. But that's, that, that is really the first time I remember hanging out solidly with you and with your wife and, uh, and being like, man, I just get, you know, you guys are just great. A great folks to know. We talked about your boys and scouts and sorry, I'll get back. I, like I said, everyone knows I love tangents and I love them. Oh, yeah. But one of the things that I see on your social media that I'm so intrigued with and I'm so jealous of, and I mean, I'm going to load my boy in a truck and we're going to come up there one day with you is you guys play airsoft. You and your sons go play airsoft and you like shooting little, you like run around shooting little kids. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. That's, yeah, that sums it up. <laughs> it's, you know, it's like the one thing that is not off-roaded related that I get to do with our kids. And it's, you know, it's a hobby that they got interested in, you know, as y- younger boys, um, you know, toy guns and, and, and this and that. And I always like, you know, they, they'd hit me up, Hey, well, we want to buy this new airsoft gun. It's like 300 bucks. And I was like, what? You can go get a, let's, let's buy a real firearm, you know, a, a nice rifle or something that you can keep forever for that much money. And, and, and eventually they got me to go and man, I tell you what, I got hooked. It's, it's silly. You know, it's, we get to run around and play army and, you know, but it's just time I get to spend with my kids and which I usually don't get a lot of it's, you know, we're out at the races or a will and events or Jeep club meetings or running the business here till midnight and 
you know, it's, it's, it's the one thing that I get to connect with them and it's, it is fun. I mean, you get to run around and shoot little kids with BB guns kind of pretty much kind of like, you know, days of when you used to grow up when you had a BB gun, you go play out in the woods and you, the one pump, you know, rule is one of those. But then you pump it 10 times. Yeah. You pump it a little, yeah, you get a couple extra pumps on them. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's, it's fun. You know, we, it's a little bit different than paintball. You know, you get to dress up, you know, fatigues and all the cool gear with the Molly stuff and, you know, all, you know, it's really neat. And some guys really get into it where they got radios and, you know, all the camouflage and, you know, the, like a sniper kit. And uh, yeah, they, they, they're, you know, you can take it as far as you want. Yeah. Like ghillie suits and yeah, stock. ghillie suit. That's it. They even have they even have mill sims to the point where like these guys actually have military operations that they usually do like 36 hour ops and stuff like that. And it's all, you know, it's really, you know, it's pretty cool how they put it together and they make it pretty lifelike. They've got real explosions and fireballs and, you know, all kinds of stuff that they that you could, you know, get to do. But in the in the end, you're just shooting little white plastic BBs at each other. <laughs> So you had a story that you told me uh, when we kind of went by this the first time and you, but you didn't tell the story. So let's go into this and tell the story because I don't know what it was. I think I kind of a little bit, but you, you, <laughs> yeah. you, it wasn't until after the interview, you go, man, I should have told this story. Yeah, we were, um, we were playing this one field and I was on this elevated platform. It was a Connex box and um, the, the, the setup I have is like a sniper. It's a sniper setup. I've got a spring gun. It's one shot, and but it's a lot more powerful and a lot more range. But it's harder to hit people because you only get one shot. So this uh, this kid came around the side of us, and he wasn't paying attention, and he was looking one way, and I was looking right down on him, and kind of the side profile. So I I drew my scope and got him in my in my sight, and I squeezed I squeezed it off, and right when I fired, he turned and faced right at me, and I followed that BB, and it dropped, and it hit him right in the groin area and he doubled over and he come up and he says, you shot me in my penis. And I just, we, <laughs> everybody lost it. Everybody that was right there could hear him was just, just, it was amazing. It was hilarious. And I mean, it was, it was something else. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah man. Was, when I see your pictures and uh, your video that you've gone to social media with, cause you're pretty social media savvy. You, you post up a lot of stuff and you're all about, you know, Facebook stories and Instagram stories. So I get my, get my feel of what's going on in uh, the Adam and Clarissa world uh, on a regular basis. But that, that stuff, when I see those, Oh, oh, I get so entrenched. I'm like, man, I got to load my boy. We got to go up there. We got to go up there. We, uh, I, we, I was, we were playing at the same field like a year or two later. And that same kid was on the, um, was out there and he came up to me, goes, Hey man, you're the guy that shot me in a wiener. Wasn't it? I was like, yeah, that was me. Sorry about that. (laughs) He's going to be scarred for life. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh man, remember that hopefully time. I didn't, hopefully I didn't, you know, you know, give him any kind of, you know, permanent damage. Uh, you don't, yeah. <laughs> I don't know you know what to say about I doubt that. It. I doubt it. Off of the air, you know, off the airsoft stuff, which I think is so fascinating because I, I, I do, I really want to come up there and crawl through the grass. I love playing paintball as a kid. The, like the day I got married to my wife, you know, most guys you go play uh, like golf beforehand, basically have too many beers. We all went and played paintball before my wedding, and there was a bunch of us were you know welted up pretty good because we we did not pull any punches on anybody. It was uh, you're throwing as much paint down the field as possible, like we're going out in a blaze of glory. Off off of that, I know you're you like woodworking, you like uh, building things, and I saw in your new shop as you guys were moving in, you built a ton of cabinets. I was like, man, this guy's handy as hell, I had a regular regular old carpenter. Yeah, actually. Uh, I, when I grew up, I, I, you know, right out of high school, actually I was still in high school. Um, I was, um, I was a trim carpenter. Um, I did on the, on the weekends and during summer break, I worked uh, for a friend of my dad's, um, running trim and these really nice houses that were being built, you know, in my hometown, you know, base mold and crown and then started doing fireplace mantles and trimming doors and, you know, just the whole, all of that. And then I worked in a, a cabinet shop for a few years, building real high end custom cabinets. And I've, you know, I've always loved work, woodworking and, and, you know, kind of being crafty. My dad was like that. He, he was a, a handyman, kind of jack of all trades, master of none. And I learned a ton from him, you know, the, to the eye to, you know, to see a, 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 a pro, you know, a finished project and how to, what you need to do to get it there, to build it. And I kind of, you know, I take a lot of that from him and, but yeah, I, I still today love building stuff out of wood. It's, you know, it's completely different than metal. It's, you know, it's a, another little uh, release for me, but yeah, the cabinets at the shop, we, um, 
that's one of those kind of see a need, fill a need. We had all our parts bins and, and tubs and stuff at the old shop where it was quite an eyesore and I wanted to go into the new shop and not have, you know, any of that exposed. So I built some real nice cabinets and to be able to house all that stuff and close the doors and keep all that clutter out of sight. And you just did that. I mean, you guys have been in the new digs how many days now? I think we're like three weeks. We started moving three weeks ago. Yeah, I think when I was up there was the the Monday before the Monday of Thanksgiving, whichever day that was, and you guys were waiting on your certificate of occupancy, your yeah, we were, CO. Yeah, we were ready to go on standby. Yep. Really, yeah, we'd walk through coals to get the, out of that old shop. <laughs> Everybody's trucks had a trailer hooked to them. Just in case when the word came in, like, hey, we got it, cease, cease and assist, all work, load it on trailers, yep. we're moving it to the new place. We were we were definitely at that point. Yeah, we were ready to get that get the H out of that shop. I love it. So, man, yeah. how did you make the transition from, you know, like I said, out of high school, then doing woodworking, you know, working in a cabinet shop? With I, I always find people's stories so fascinating and how they got to where they are today. And I think, don't get me wrong, I think a lot of people find that fascinating, but what was the point where you ended up spinning wrenches or welding or fabricating or where did you get? I think, you know, I, I went from the woodworking construction job and I had a, I had a curiosity or I had a, you know, a hobby with car stereos. I love, you know, when you, you're 16, you get your first car, you know, you want to put a cool stereo system and it's bumping in it. And I always had a, you know, a knack for that. And so I went into the custom car stereo business and worked for a custom, you know, a couple of high end shops building really, really nice car stereo systems for some high end people. Um, the, when we lived in San Antonio, I did, you know, a ton of the San Antonio Spurs players, a lot of their vehicles and did real high end stuff in them. And, and that was kind of neat because, you know, we, we got to be real creative and, and do all kinds of fiberglass work and Bondo and vinyls and uh, interior upholstery. And, you know, we did some welding and some metal fabrication for trim pieces and stuff like that, you know, just really kind of neat stuff. And, but I, I did that for a handful of years and kind of got burned out on it. When we moved back from San Antonio to, uh, to the Dallas Fort Worth area, I took a little time off and I ended up going across the street to, uh, the local dealership. It was, a uh, at the time it was a Nissan, Chrysler Jeep dealership and it was right next to the house and I need something to do. So I went over there, got a, I got a job just, you know, working as a general used car mechanic doing, uh, you know, when the cars come in and we, we prep them and stuff for resale and they had the Jeep dealership there and, uh, they started doing, uh, aftermarket accessories on the, uh, brand new Jeeps. They come in on the transport and we'd, we'd put a little lift kit on them and some Chrome tube bumpers and, uh, put them out on the front lot for sale. And, you know, that, I don't know how they found me, but they, they found me to start doing all their accessories. And so I ended up doing more that more than, you know, working on used cars. And, uh, one day the, the owner of the business and the general manager got invited to a Jeep jamboree. And obviously, you know, they own a Jeep dealership and they, so they were like, yeah, we'll go. And so they went wheeling and of course they were hooked, you know, they're like, yeah, this is so fun. We got a, we own a Jeep dealership. We should, you know, have, go out and have some fun. So they went to one and came back excited and they ended up getting a brand new LJ off the transport and they brought it to me and we did a small lift kit and some tires and they went to the next Jeep Jamboree. And, you know, of course you, you see all the cool things out there and you want to do the next hard trail. And so it just snowballs from there, the next, you know, evolution. And, you know, next thing you know, they bring it back and we want to do 35s and, you know, some lockers and, you know, this and that. And they go back out and come back and, oh, we now we need some steering. We need, you know, now we can't turn the wheels. We need 37s and a bigger engine or something like that. And they go out to the next one. And next thing now we're one tons and 40 inch coilovers and a cage. And, you know, it just, you know, like, like it happens to everybody, you know, you, you, you get a little taste and you keep going and, um, you know, it just, it, you know, you get hooked and, and that's kind of, and, and, and throughout all that, they, you know, I worked on it the whole time and they kind of got me to go to a couple events and, you know, and then I got hooked, you know, before then I should, I had before that I had no, really no interest in off-road. You know, they're bringing you parts and saying, we're going to do this. And you're like, oh, I don't know how to do this. So you're, where were you getting your, uh, who were you leveraging? Pirate four by four. Where Damn else are you going to go? <laughs> Damn straight. Yeah. It's, a, it's the only, sh only show in town. 
That's it. Yeah. I mean, I, I was just a, you know, just a used car mechanic and just learning about Jeeps and, and off-roading. And I really didn't know what did what and, and why you did this. And, you know, I, I met the guys over at PSC Motorsports and we ended up over there needing steering for, you know, one of these Jeeps. And um, I met them and, and I met Lance Gilbert there and he's probably, he's probably the one that turned me on to pirate four by four and he said, Hey, you know, go look at this. And, and, you know, of course every night, you know, you're, I'm scouring the internet learning and learning what this did and what, you know, how this worked or, you know, these guys cool projects. And, you know, that was, that was a huge inspiration was, was pirate for me. Um, in those, you know, back in that time. And, and actually it's, I say back in that time, it wasn't that long ago. It was, you know, 10 years ago or uh, maybe 12 years ago. Uh, right before we we had tribe start up and then the relationships that came out of that i mean all your online boyfriends that come to fruition you meet them in you know there's no there's no four-wheel drive tender today that was the the four-wheel drive tender of the day (laughs) right (laughs) right so swipe right on that guy (laughs) (laughs) no but it's so true i mean there was uh so many relationships were formed uh on that uh that page and how much we garnered just information wise. I wasted, you know, half of my half my twenties on uh on that website. Just just surfing, just reading, build yeah. after build after build after build and just the genius, the level of genius that used to float around on that page was just amazing. And then and then it started going to going to hell. Then it got sold. And then there was Facebook yeah. and now we're in a circle of I don't know what it is. <laughs> I don't that's so, the social media downward spiral, yeah, the, yeah. taking out forums one by one. We have regressed on so many levels when it comes to off-roading that, in my opinion. But uh, so, yeah, man, you're working at the dealership and you're just you're just cranking out Jeeps for these guys. And you meet Lance, who Lance and you have been close and tight friends for now. I mean, going on 15 years of that, maybe, maybe a little bit more. I'd say 15 years, yes. Yeah. You know Tom Allen. Tom was the 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 brains behind PSC his, his business over there in Azel. Oh, he's he's a hell of a guy too. You get noticed working in the back of the dealership, and you're doing a little work for Tom on the side. W- walk us uh, into that world where you went from being the bolt-on specialist at the dealership to fabricating in your own garage. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I had a, an interest, and it turned into a, pretty much a passion. And I, I guess I met the right people at the right time that really kind of helped me along, you know, yeah, I was, we were just doing bolt on stuff in the, at the, in the back of the dealership. And it actually turned into a, like a little sub business that they were running called screaming lizard. And, you know, we did everything from just regular stuff to Hemi swaps to cages and, to, you know, all kinds of stuff. And, but it's, it, it, we started working on, uh, Tom Allen's from PSC. They, once we met them and, you know, asked about the steering stuff and, you know, they, they started bringing some of their Jeeps down to us for us to do some stuff to them. And they really liked our work and, you know, just got a really kind of had a friendship going and to the point where I'd come out to his house on the weekends and at nights and help them work on some of the race cars uh, when they're racing with on track racing and Dean Bullock and, you know, help them do some wiring or, you know, do this or do that. And I think that really kind of showed Tom that, you know, I was really interested in all this stuff and, maybe I had some potential. And so he really kind of went out on a leg and said, Hey, you know, if you ever think about leaving the dealership, you know, and starting your own business, you know, let me know and I'll help you out. You know, we can find a little something, little hole in the wall, a little you know, shop to get you started and I'll help you out. And I jumped at it. I said, yeah, let's do it. You know, he's, he's kind of also, I had a lot of help from some other, you know, a lot of other people in my family and my wife, she pushed me forward a lot too, to start my own business. But he, uh, you know, he's, I kind of, you know, jumped on that and, and that's how tribe started. I love the story. Uh, and dig out further, but man, you threw out Dean Bullock's name. I haven't heard that name in years. Many people probably haven't heard that name in years. He was a uh, notorious, like you, you saw his buggies were always red with yellow flames. He wore a red and yellow flame fire suit, red and yellow flame t-shirt. You know, you saw him everywhere. He looked like he was on fire, no matter where you saw Dean Bullock. But then I saw he he got out of you know KOH style racing at one point, got into UTVs, and if you've heard any of this story, let me know. Or I know someone's out there knows more of the story because I'm only here saying this. But then he had a really bad UTV wreck. Yeah, I think. Then I haven't heard anything since then. So, I mean, maybe some people. Yeah, I guess that that did him in there. I guess you know that was back when I was just getting into off road, and 
and we, the first time I went out to King of the Hammers was in 2010. And that was with, uh, I went out, you know, with, uh, PSC Motorsports to help out their race team, uh, with the on-track racing. And, and actually I did that for uh, many years, went out there just to support PSC and worked on race cars and changed steering this and, you know, just helped the racers out and helped him out and, you know, and he took care of us. And yeah, that was, that's kind of what got me into KOH. And then Tom started a, a, a little racing group or a, a venture, Tom Allen. His deal was, was it ASR? Is that right? Yeah. ASR, which was Allen Shear Racing. And that was not too long after uh, he helped me get into the shop and get Tribe established. And he came to me and said, hey, let's let's start a little sub, you know, side business and, you know, as a kind of a race shop. And that's that's when we built the first white car as ASR and we, we got Jason to drive it for us. And um, that's how kind of that started. And at that time, Jason had only won, he'd won King of the Hammers. He was the King in 2009 at that point. And so this is probably 10, 11, yeah, somewhere in there. And then you guys built the little car that we talked about earlier, the 4,200 pound, what came to be, it was Mike Bo's car. Now you guys built that shortly thereafter under the ASR moniker as well, right? Yep. Yep. Love connecting the dots on those because, you know, we've seen that little card ha- had had so much success and to see how you guys put that thing together. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. You built the chassis, but the front end, the front end came from California. Yes. So you, and then you guys made it them up like 10 days before a race or something like that. Yeah, it was crazy. Um, I believe, let's see, uh, Wild, Mess, Wild West Motorsports did all the design work and then Jason and Dan Trout did all the, you know, they assembled and welded everything together uh, in Jason's garage and they shipped it to us. It arrived to the shop the day after Christmas and we scabbed it to the back half of the car the next couple of days. And it was just, you know, a thrash fest trying to get it to run and to finish out, you know, paneling and graphics and, all, you know, all the, all the, little, the little details that should take six months. We crammed it in a one month. You know, and it was a train wreck. You know, I'll, I'll never build a car like that again. You know, days before KOH, we it, we called that hell week because we, I mean, we had to change everything in the car. We went through two transmissions, the fuel cell leak, the transfer case was, something was messed up with it. I think the front ring and pinion broke. Uh, it was just, it was, it was just crazy. The right, some of the steering mechanism, in the front fell apart. It was just, I don't know. It was just, a, it was a nightmare, but new car it, blues. It was, yeah, it was new car blues, but you know, all learning experience, you know, some, you know, we won't ever, if somebody came today and said, Hey, I want a car for KOH. I'd be like, no, sorry, we can't, we can't help you out on that one. We, but you learn, you take a lot away from that. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a learning experience just like, you know, the days of the pirate, you know, searching on everybody build and you see what works and what didn't work for guys. And it's, you, you know, that's the easy way to learn there. We've talked about two cars you built for Jason Shearer that, that work, but you have a very long and distinguished list of guys that you've built cars for. You've got, you know, you did a car for Chicky Barton. That car ended up going to, that's Clay Gilstrap's current car. Actually, Clay has that for sale. So if anyone hears this and is looking for an IFS car in Texas that has tribe all over it, man, reach out to Clay. Well, he's on a boat right now. Yeah, that car is fast. I mean, he's he's done real good with it. He's, I think he the hot spring races. Um, he he took first in three of them. I think it was two or three of them. And I mean, he's always done super fast in that car. What was the dirt riot race that was out around Fredericksburg? What was that location? Um, canyons? Is it canyons? Canyons. Canyons. Yeah. I remember canyons racing canyons at one point in life, and Clay coming by in that thing. I had uh, thrown a front drive shaft. And no, I'm sorry. I'd thrown a rear drive shaft and Clay came by and he had thrown his front drive shaft. So he's in two wheel drive, but just the rear end. I was in two wheel drive, the front end. And he goes to go up this. It's a sheer, it's a sheer cliff. I mean, it's 60 yards near vertical that you had to go up and Clay hit that thing. He was probably doing 75 at the bottom and he came out the top in 60 yards. He's going maybe 15 miles an hour. He's on Maxxis. I mean, a commercial for Maxxis tires. He is chucking boulders the size of bowling balls off of this climb. And at the end of the race, there was pictures circulating. I might've even been one to take one of the pictures of these Maxxises. They were chunked out slicks is what they look like. They looked like chunked out slicks. The front tires look damn near new. But the rear was chunked out slicks. 
I remember that. Yeah, they were gnarly. It was it was very impressive. On it was just how and they still held just air. How destroyed they were. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyway, if anyone's looking for a just an amazing tribe IFS card, th- there you go. Uh, Clay Gilstrap, like I said, he's sailing right now. But by the time you hear this, he'll be back and immediately uh, ready to ready to move on his car. But now you built a. You know, we talked about the laparoscopic car earlier. Uh, you built a bunch of cars for Wacker, and uh, that's Alex Wacker, and he just sold his one of his cars to. Uh, Rufus yep. and Rufus already owned multiple tribe cars. You know, one yeah. was a Keenan Leatherwood build that went to Demolition Matt down in San Antonio. If anyone follows his YouTube channel, Demolition Matt or Demo Ranch or wh- wh- whatever number that is on YouTube, and then that car came back to it came back to Fort Worth. Who ended up with buying it back from Demo Matt? Rufus, straight up. The Rufus, yeah, the Rufus Racing guys. Yeah, they have three of our cars now. Yeah, the first one, which originally was a Rowdy Trubenbach's car that we built for him, and then Doug bought that, and then the Rufus has that. It's amazing. We had we built a lot of Texas cars, and they seem to all kind of stay in Texas. Pretty awesome. And Summers, you've got Summers in the mix there. Yeah, Chris Summers' car. Yep. Yeah, we. But that said, I think there was a point in time when I remember looking at like race entries and race finishing, and basically, if you owned a Tribe car and you raced in the Midwest odds were pretty good. It was like two out of three cars on the podium were going to be tribe cars. Pretty good stats. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. A lot of it, you know, a lot of that is, is race prep. You know, a lot of the guys would bring in the cars to us for us to race prep them. And, you know, the guys here at the shop, especially Ryan Donaldson, he's, you know, he's my main guy here and he does a lot of the, the race prep and, you know, he's spot on. He's so he's, you know, that's, that's a lot of, you know, a lot of that, those results are from, you know, spending the time in the garage and, and here in the shop and, you know, and all, all the guys, blood, sweat and tears they put back there and, and going to the races, you know, we, we, you know, we'd shut down a shop and make it to all the races and help them out at the races and, you know, what they needed to get done if something came up to, to help them race. So, well, and that's part of this tribe, right? The, this is that's literally it. the tribe and your, your support network is truly amazing. I mean, I, I've talked about this certainly in you know, in person with you and Matt Howell and certainly in, in interview Matt Howell, we talked about this. Like if I, if myself, Wyatt Pemberton can walk into your shop from five hours away and know everybody in that shop by name, and I'm not in your shop regularly. What is it? Maybe once or twice a year or over the last 10 years, I've probably been there maybe 10 times, but recently walked in and recognized easily 10 people that work for you. I don't, you don't even have 10 employees, do you? <laughs> that sounds good though. <laughs> it does. <laughs> But you're I think there. everybody might everybody might think we have ten employees, but no, we don't. Yeah, right. Uh, but yeah, walking in there and seeing, well, always. I mean, seeing Lance's face. Lance is an amazing, amazing dude. Uh, you know, plus then you got Ryan Donaldson. He's a great guy. You had Billy Drake in there for a very long time. I mean, you've rotated through some guys. You got Josh Whitesides in there now. David Demoise worked for you for a while, and he's he's oh, yeah. just a he's a hell of a welder. Double D. Double D. All of my welding tables in my shop are from from Dave. I think they're also oh, yeah. similar to you. I think you have a bunch of double Dave, uh, welding tables in your shop too. fixtures. Yeah, our, our fixture tables. Yeah. 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 Uh, we got, uh, will, uh, one of our younger guys is will he's a super talented guy. Ama- you know, amazing welder. He's, he's super very put together. He can figure stuff out and he's learning. He's on the up and up. And we just got a new, uh, a new employee too, that just started recently, uh, Neil Reimer, and he actually comes from the truck scene. He does a lot of uh, truck stuff, fabrication, uh, air ride, suspension stuff. And so we're, uh, we've, we've been trying to, to get, have him come over for quite a while. He's an amazing fabricator also. And he, we're, we're, we're pretty glad he's on board with us. I heard he's into like hydraulic suspensions. Is that right or wrong? No, I, it mostly was all air ride air stuff. Bike? Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't think he did any hydraulics, no. We, we'd follow him on the, on social media and, you know, he posts kind of like I do, you know, all the cool things that, that gets built around the shop and things that he makes. And, you know, we, we're, we're always eyeballing it going, man, we need him to come over and build some cool stuff for us. You know, the opposite though, instead of making them lower, making them taller kind of thing. And so we're, we're excited to have him on board and he's already kicking butt and, you know, figuring things out. And that's pretty cool. But yeah, let's talk about it. So I think this is the great segue into the last 10 years of tribe. So you guys are, you know, your business, you started, you know, sole proprietor there in the beginning. Um, little entrepreneur action. You had some help from Tom as a partner getting that going, but he was, he was hands off and somewhere in there you bought Tom out or worked your way out from under to where you were running your own show, but you were 
drinking from a fire hose. You're getting blasted in the face by paperwork and taxes and answering the phone. And if anyone knows anything about ordering parts in the four-wheel drive community, it's like you may order them and then you worry if they're going to come tomorrow or three weeks or six weeks or never like Doug's axles. Still looking for those. Yeah, still looking for those. You know, I'm not going to give those guys credit, but Doug is still looking for his axles. Hell of a story. But I mean, and that's what I've noticed to mess around the four wheel drive world myself and my cars and my parts. And man, no one seems to deliver. There's a handful of companies that you're just like you stick to and you love them and you stick with them. And, and then there's other people that they don't realize how bad it is. So they have a buffer between them and their pocketbook. And that's guys like Adam. You're taking that on. So you were doing all that drinking from a fire hose, just getting blasted while also fabricating, while also being a boss by also doing payroll. How did you keep it together for as long as you did? That's tough. You know, it's, you know, there's, there's many, there's many times I went home and cried, you know, it's, it's rough and, you know, there's only so much one guy can do. And, you know, and it's, that's why we had so many late nights trying to get all the stuff done and, you know, and, and invoices and paperwork and taxes. And my wife would try to help me out with that. And both of us don't know what the hell we're doing. And, you know, next thing you know, we're trying to figure things out and it's, you know, it, it, it was really tough. And I kind of, you know, I got to a point where I couldn't do anymore. I couldn't, I plateaued, you know, I could only build so much and I could only, you know, take on so many customers and do so much office stuff and answer the phone so much. And, you know, we did that for 10 years, no, you no, know, eight years. And, and that's when that's kind of when Matt Howell and uh, and Lance Gilbert approached me and you know asked me if they you know if I needed help if they wanted to uh, help grow the business. Yeah, and that and how that discussion it, you know, comes to fruition is absolutely amazing. And up until this call, uh, and up until talking to Matt and you combined, I didn't realize that Lance was in, and so I really regret not you know us not happening having a time and snippet to get Lance in here because that Lance is a walking, talking off-road encyclopedia. He is, you know, and that's, it, it's kind of funny because Lance knows so much more than I do. He's been in this market for so much longer and knows the product and knows the older Jeeps. And he came from Sunray engineering and, you know, they're pioneered a bunch of this stuff and I'm, you know, I'm relatively new. It's, you know, I, I still feel pretty fortunate that I am what I, where we are today. I mean, it's, I'm relatively kind of green. I, I still consider myself a greenhorn to a lot of this stuff. We get a, you know, a, a Jeep customer comes in and he wants to talk about leaf springs and stuff on his, his CJ. And I, I got to turn him over to Lance. Cause I don't know anything about that stuff. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> the, 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 well, at least that you have somebody like that. I mean, we're finding yeah. in the, you know, just an auto repair world that it's hard to find anybody that can tune a carburetor today. Like I, yeah. I used to have a carburetor guy. He, he passed away several years ago and I don't have anyone to, to touch those anymore. So it almost, it almost makes sense to go to EFI on some level because you just, you can't find the guys to work on the old stuff anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm pretty fortunate to have the guys that we have here that, you know, the experience that they, they have and, you know, Lance and, and all the things that he knows and he carries that he carries a lot of weight around here. He is an amazing dude. And Lance, I know you're going to listen to this. I apologize. This is why I apologize for you. I didn't realize uh, that I had, uh, you know, excluded you from this, these conversations, but I'm sure you're okay. Not, <laughs> not being put on the spot as well. We'll drink, we'll drink beer over at Lance. I'll see you in February. Matt Howe came on, Lance came on, you guys get together and you were tribe four by four, but there was always the joke that, uh, tribe 16, right? Cause it's four times four, right? Four by four. So you guys, you just made a big joke out tribe 16. So you guys are, that's the new business. You know, the, the, the company going forward is tribe 16, correct? That's correct. Yep. I love that. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of people are like, what's the 16 is, I don't understand what the 16 is. And I, I have to tell them a little joke from the back from the car stereo days when we had a customer came in and he was wondering how many 54s that he could fit in the back deck of his car. We were all boggled. Like, what do you mean 54s? He goes, you know, how many, how many 54s can I have in the back deck of my car? And nobody, they were all, you know, he goes, you know, six by nines, six times nine 54s. How many 54s can I have in my back deck? So we were like, I told that joke a couple of times and somebody said, you know what? You should just start calling it Tribe 16, you know, four times four. So that's kind of how that, that little joke came to be, and it stuck. It's perfect. No, I, lo I love that story. <laughs> that, is, uh, <laughs> that is legit. And so now, if you ever need some, some 54s, you know, you can. <laughs> I heard a story. I feel, like, I feel like this was a Tribe story, and I feel like this came from Shannon Welch. 
is my source on this. I, but correct me if I'm wrong. Y'all were at a race. It might have been Hot Springs, and they kept calling out someone else was 16. And then y'all were going through a car that had, you know, it said Tribe 16. And the course workers kept writing down the 16 off the side door. It was Chris Summers. And he's six seven eight. Six seven eight. So when we built Chris's car, we did the graphics on it. And we originally had the big Tribe 16 on the side. And then his race number was a little bit smaller on the, you know, up on the sail panel. And every time he'd go through start finish, they were just writing down the 16. And, and Shannon was all over the place with it. She made us change it. I can see her doing that. That's yeah. uh, that, that is good. So it was <laughs> your business name and logo interfered with her track, you know, tracking yeah. number for a race, not looking at the, the shark fin. It was, which would have been six, seven, eight. They were just looking at the 16. I love it. Yeah. We have both, both his skins hanging up on the wall in the back of the shop. Oh, that, that's awesome. Where is Summer's car today? It's in our shop right now. It is. Yeah. It's uh, sold to uh, to uh, Quinton uh, Hilburn, and he's uh, out of Arkansas. And we're we're doing um, uh, some rework to it. We're doing some rewire and changing the engine management and a bunch of other things. Will we see that car back out racing? Absolutely, It'll be out hammers. Oh, awesome! Can't wait to meet this guy. Cause I know Summers got out. He's Chris Summers. He's in the he's in the crawler game. He's got the rear steer and he's leaf looking with uh a cooler in the back these days. We just we just built him a really nice Jeep Gladiator JT. I saw that. And then he did he really go down and wheel that in Mason or Wolf Caves? He was supposed to go to Wolf Caves, but he had something come up. He couldn't make it. Ah, uh, sucker. I need to call him. Regularly talk to him. He's a he's a good dude to know in in Texas. He's a North Texas guy, but uh, yeah, he's he's just an all around good guy to go drink beer with, and he's funnier than hell. So. So at that point, when you and Lance and Matt kind of got together and you partnered, you became the new Tribe 16. Tell me about what Matt and and Lance and brought to the table, where that went from where you were to where you are today. I know some of the stuff that Matt had told me that he did was, you know, he he does like a, a weekly meeting. So you guys started having like a weekly meeting and you guys even have a conference room in your new new uh, new shop, which is absolutely flooring and amazing to me. He brought some, I don't know what the right words uh, to, to put here, but some administrative task to the table to help clean up and refine and move you guys forward in time. Is that safe to say? Yeah, Matt's Matt has a an amazing business business sense. You know, that's one thing that I I I lack that I I just don't you know I have in my abilities is you know I'm a I'm a fabricator or welder or you know just a you know one of those guys back in the shop. But when it comes to running a business, you know it's 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 tough to do it all. And and obviously he's got a a, a great business sense. He's you know has very been very successful with his own business, and um, that was very exciting. You know, to me is I knew that was my shortcoming is to you know, to go to the next level, um, it was to have, you know, that help from him and that direction and, and everything else that he had, you know, the, like you said, the administrative stuff, um, already set in place and they, you know, the people that take care of his business and are now doing our, you know, a lot of our billing or, um, taxes and, you know, all the stuff that I, I just absolutely struggled with, you know, it, which frees me up to, to do more stuff in the shop and, and to focus on those things. Um, and, you know, Lance, like, like I said, we said before, Lance is an encyclopedia to off-road and he handles everything, you know, as far as, you know, doing the, the builds and ordering parts and, you know, talking with people and customers and, and keeping us going there, which also in turn keeps me back in the shop, you know, trying to be productive and helping the guys back there. And so that's, you know, the, the, those two other parts that came on board that really helped me out. And help tribe out to go to the next level um, was, you know, is just really huge for us. And then you guys just moved. I know we talked about this. Uh, you guys just moved locations. And you guys used to be in east east downtown Fort Worth. It was, I believe Matt described it as, uh, it was a destination. You, <laughs> you went there. You, you didn't just happen to drive by. You had to be with intent to drive down to where you were. We were definitely off the beaten path. You know, it was a, a first time shop. You know, you got to start somewhere, it, you know, other than the garage. It was the, the rent was cheap. The overhead was cheap. But, you know, there's a trade off here in kind of a crummy area. So, yeah, we were close to downtown. You have some amazing stories, though, uh, like Fort Worth uh, Police Department doing uh, prostitution stings in your in your driveway. 
Yeah, it was always entertaining down there. The the local populace, um, what they see on the street, we had we we had names for all kinds of different. What would you call them? Uh, I don't know the the daily people you'd meet or, or not meet. You see the what am I trying to say? The I don't know. We 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 had names for all the all the crazies down there. You know, we could we had Stumpy and you know all these just all these different you know names for all the knuckleheads down there. We we pretty much knew all the locals and we had nicknames for them all. Yeah, right. I love it. And you told me at one point you like you had to call nine one one to have uh, have them do like a helicopter flyover over the shop just to see make sure there wasn't like some some crispy from stealing copper, stealing stealing power lines because your power was knocked out and there was the smell of burnt flesh or no? Yeah, we we uh, got to the shop one day and opened up and there was no power and you know the first thing I think of is you know. Well, there goes my amazing business skills. I couldn't even pay the damn power bill. And so we go around the back and, you know, the breaker has not been messed with. It's not off. And we look up and, yeah, the, the main power had been cut on top of the roof. And it's like, who in the world would climb up on the roof and cut live power lines, to try to steal that copper? That's crazy. Well, they did it, <laughs> or at least uh, attempted to try. And then you had a, oh, what a, an art articulating ramp. You had to build a new one of those because you had one of those walk off. Somebody wanted to do some mall crawling more than you guys. Right to the, straight to the scrapyard. <laughs> yeah. And they, and they, and they got $3 and 16 cents for it. Appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks guys. The other ones, and our, our dumpster, our dumpster has always been something else. I mean, I, I get it. You know, you need to throw some junk away, but oh man, I tell you what, it was just a constant battle. <laughs> well, well, if you follow Adam on, uh, on, on Facebook or on Instagram, his chronicles of that dumpster, I mean, that dump, you could write a, a novel about each day with that dumpster. Every day was something new. You come in, there'd be a couch, there'd be a refrigerator, there'd be piles of whatever. Every day, yep. something new. Every day, so something new. We moved right when we moved out a couple of weeks ago. We're completely out of the shop. The dumpster's empty. And we had to go back there to meet somebody to get something. And our guys said that somebody had filled the dumpster entirely full of cement. And I was like, you know what? That's so cool. I don't care. I'm out. <laughs> Done. That's freaking construction workers, man. I mean, you can't take them anywhere. <laughs> you know, that's that's Matt's people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah. man. Now, so you guys lever leveraging Matt house skills and stuff, you guys located this new shop over in which it's closer to everybody's house, right? You guys all like everybody that works there. This is, you guys moved how many minutes closer, 15 minutes closer, 20 minutes closer to home. Uh, it's a lot closer for all the guys. I, I'm literally like two minutes away from the shop. Yeah. It's, it's a bonus for everybody. Oh man, that's outstanding. And anyone that's in Fort Worth or, well, I guess this is, you guys are in Richland Hills is where the, the new shop location is. But if you get a chance, if you're in Fort Worth for whatever reason passing through, you need to stop at Tribe 16 because, I mean, just, just an outstanding classy place. Like I said, they even have a conference room. I was very impressed by that. Uh, and you guys opened up a handful more bays. How many more bays did you get? At the old shop, we only had two car lifts and we had... We only had basically two bays, but, you know, they're kind of long shotgun style warehouse is what we started with. And now it's the opposite where we have five bays and five car lifts and, you know, all kinds of extra room and stuff like that. We've got a nice uh, fenced in backyard and, you know, actual legitimate showroom. And it's I, I tell you what, I mean, we're just all of us are just so super excited. You know, Matt's Matt's uh, business, TBI, the tenant build uh, incorporated, they they did all the construction and remodel here and they just knocked it out of the park. It's just, it's, I mean, we're, we're in heaven right now. And you guys just had an open house last weekend. Absolutely. It was it last weekend? Was it just like, yeah, yeah, it was last weekend because yeah. I knew I couldn't make it. And I caught a lot of hell from that. Uh, like Aaron Peters calling me and, and Summer's calling me and be like, why aren't you showing up or are you going to be there? And I'm like, dude, no, I mean, my, I've got a son who plays baseball, like I swear, every weekend. And so, yeah, we had a baseball tournament. And there was no driving up to Fort Worth. I regret missing it. But seeing the pictures, seeing everybody there, man, oh. Uh, yeah, amazing open house party event. You know, we had a, a huge turnout, great turnout. But you, it's not your, you know, it's not your only chance. We, um, you know, we do have multiple parties and events that we have here that we're gonna pick back up at the new shop. Our crawfish boil we do every year was gonna be bigger and better this year. You know, we're probably gonna end up bringing back the Halloween party. We're hell, we're, even, we're even doing a Christmas party here in a couple, like in a week for uh, one of the local Jeep Brew Crew clubs. Uh, they're oh, very nice. They're hosting their Christmas party here. It's pretty cool to get some Jeepers in the in the new shop. Get to show it off a bit. 
No, yeah, that's absolutely, and hopefully sell some stuff. Get some of your bolt-on business going because yeah. you, know, you do you do some cool stuff. So I I, I do want to get into what Tribe does. So as far as we've talked about so far, it's just really been just your race car business. But you guys are so much more than that. You guys do a ton of bolt-on work, ton of local lift stuff, tires, wheels. Uh, but one of the things that I saw when I was in a few weeks ago, and we talked about Chris Summers Gladiator, you guys were uh, jigging up some rock sliders for uh, a Gladiator. So you guys are going to be putting out a Gladiator line of rock sliders. Yeah, we have we've got some uh, kind of our own take on some rock sliders for the for the JK, the JLUs, and and now the the JT Gladiators. All bolt on, they bolt on the frame, and they're pretty heavy duty. Oh no! I saw them. Yeah, he- heavy as hell. You can cr- you can cr- crush the rest of the car, and they'll still be good. Th- they're going to stand up to summers. I mean, they've got to be something good. That's that's saying something. But yeah, you've got a bunch of those. And then you have another product line that I, I guess this would circle back to the airsoft stuff, where uh, you know Molly gear, you know military gear, you know the Molly. Did Molly replace Alice? Was that remember the old Alice setups? Mm-hmm. Not sure on that one. Yeah, they're, they're like uh, you know the. Well, anyway, the Molly gear is just any of those Velcro pouches or whatever and, and holsters and ammo p- packs and first aid kits. And they uh, they latch on to the, the webbing and you start producing a Molly type setup. And that's M-O-L-L-E. Yeah. You know, I, I totally geeked out, you know, on that from when we were playing airsoft and, you know, you know, setting up your your outfit and your gear and all your stuff like that. And. I think I've seen it somewhere else where some other guys were doing it and we wanted to make it a little more form fitting and, and direct bolt onto the, to the Jeep platform. And we're still working on it. We've got stuff out for the, the JL and the JK, but we're, we're also working on some other things. It's just been, it's been real busy right now with moving shops and KOH coming up. We haven't um, had a chance to further the line on it, but yeah, it's really cool. It's, and it's super handy. You know, you can stuff them full of all the loose you know, things you need in your Jeep, you know, like first aid kit and, you know, recovery gear. And you just, you just never know toilet paper and, you know, just the things that there's all kinds of things that you just don't think about that, you know, you can use on the day to day or in an emergency situation uh, to have in your Jeep. And it's, you know, sto- stores it away nice and fully custom, you know, customizable. Well, I know for some people who are maybe having a hard time visualizing that you can certainly hit up on Instagram at the tribe 16, the tribe 16. Or, you know, Adam Shearer, they're on Facebook as Tribe 16 as well. We'll get it. And then you have them on your website at www.tribe16.com, right? There you go. Yep. You can purchase them straight from the website. We have everything. We've got all all the kits ready to go boxed. We have all the bags. We even have our own little Tribe patch, Velcro patch that goes on them, which is really cool little detail. So can I put one of those on like the front of my Bulletproof S? Absolutely. It will definitely keep it safe. It'll stop it. Yeah, you know, that, that uh, knockdown power. And mm-hmm. then you guys do some uh, like some coilover towers. Have You guys have quite a few little products that you've kind of cranked out of a necessity. We've dabbled out a little, some little bit of product. We're, we're still learning. Uh, we're still new in the game as far as trying to you know get them to market. And on the website, we got a few items on the website. And it's been a big learning curve. Lance has kind of figured out, taught himself a lot of the website stuff and everything that's involved in it. And it's, it's kind of slow growing, but... But we're slowly getting there to where we have a handful of small products, some coilover towers, the rock rails, the molly, the product, and just, you know, a handful of small things. We have apparel that you can purchase, you know, hats and T-shirts and tribe gear and all that good stuff off the website. We'd like to, you know, to get that rolling good and and to where we have a a kind of a broad product, just Jeep related stuff and help kind of fund some of our stuff. Yeah, I was just trying to get to the point made that, yeah, you guys just aren't a race car shop or a fab shop, you actually, you guys, have, you do it all. You, from from A to Z, you bring in whatever, and it will go out highly much more capable after it's left the tribe shop. So, Adam, we've covered a whole bunch of ground. There's one thing that I really want to get into before we say adios is KOH 2020. What's the tribe plan? What's the tribe goal? How many cars are you guys supporting out there? Is Wacker's pre-runner going to be done? Is he going to be out there even though he's says he's out of 4,400 and sold his car? So, yeah, we... Uh... Actually, just not too long ago, decided that we're going to race it again. Uh, Matt and Matt and I are going to give it one more go in the 4510 uh, for the EMC race, and so we're going to be up on the short course. We are doing the fire pit again. We're sponsoring the fire pits. Be a tribe one. We're going to kind of redo what we built last year, make it bigger and better, and uh, maybe some new events uh, to kind of you know liven it up a little bit, bring it back. 
now you're speaking my language. Now you're speaking my language. And this time, can we literally like get in crates or whatever truckloads of the largest fireball bottles known to man? And so we can pass those around. Because I want to see guys like the rock zombies. Like I want to see Danny Edwards holding up like a 60 pound fireball and chugging from it. That's for you, Danny. We'll have to make it happen. Yeah, I, I, I think I clearly remember drinking fireball with you uh, maybe last year, year before. Yep. Yeah, it's happened. And that's where this came up. It was where uh, it was kind of our first soiree with uh, some of the rock zombies. And they, Danny Edwards, man, I love this guy. He's a, he's a riot. We've come to be uh, pretty, pretty close uh, online boyfriends here. He came over and tried to steal my hat. And I think that's what girls do. Like when they try to, you know, they, they're trying to impress you by taking your hat. And he's like, I'm taking this, this Texans hat. And, uh, you know, then there was like a fight that was almost going to happen, which is just ridiculous at the fire pit to begin with. Cause we're, we're all buddies. In, I mean, on, for all brothers from other mothers. I was right there. I was ready to have your back. Oh yeah. Yeah. Way back, way back. And I'm just like, what the hell is happening? And it's funny when I ended up back at the fire pit that night, miles had been with me. We had left the team Indiana area with Stan Haynes and company. And right before, as we got to the main stage, miles is like, I'm going to bed. I'm out. And he split, he went left. And I'm like, well, to get back, to, I was with the Campbells. So I had to back to the Campbells. Well, I had to cross through the fire pit. I mean, and there's of course going to be a stop there. And there you guys were with the little, uh, MJ Jeep, the little military Jeep and, uh, the hugest bottle of crown. I mean, how many gallons was that thing? It was like a three, three gallon. It wasn't a handle. It was huge. It was huge. And we're passing it around and Clarissa, your wife, Clarissa, and then Rhonda Howell, they are doing no one favors. Kendall, Kendall Huey. Oh my God. He's passing that thing. Uh, yeah, it was a, that was, that was a disaster. It was a good time, but it had not been for you guys sponsoring the fire pit and having that going i wouldn't have got to meet and you know, become friends with uh those northern california rock zombie guys so again thank you and you guys you guys sponsored the fire pit last year with that big tp with the tribal you know metal what, what do you want to call that a dongle a dangle a dongle dongle pendulum maybe yeah and then this year you guys are making a bigger one uh, i think that's really cool that um because i think that's the part of the hammers and part of koh the allure is the fire pit it's the getting around that thing and bonding and hanging out with people that you know either you've been friends with them for 20 years or 15 years or 10 years and that's the only time of the year you get to revisit that relationship and hang out with them and exactly pass a bottle of fireball around or it's the time to meet new people while you're out there too i mean it could be still 70 degrees and the wind blowing and you're going to be hanging around it, or it could be 30 degrees in the wind blowing and you're hanging around it. So I look forward to seeing everybody out there, but that's really cool that uh, the tribe's stepping in and putting that together. How exactly does that go down? You guys put it up and then pay somebody's uh, firewood delivery service to show up with a pickup truck every night? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. No. How, how far do they have to truck wood in for that? I mean, does it come all the way down from like Big Bear? I don't know where it comes from. I know they, they have it all stored right on the corner, right outside of gate one, but I don't know who brings it in. I'm going to have to edit that part out, right? Now everybody in their brothers going to be like, oh yeah, I know where all the firewood is. It's over by gate one. Yeah. And we'll get JT to post somebody up over there. You and Matt are going to go for uh, actually trying to win 4,500 this time. I mean, That's I know it. you guys have tried in the past. Three national championships. We, um, we were real close last year and the transmission gave up on us that every gear inside it broke. It only had Ford and that was it. And third only. Yeah. And third only, I think we had two rock trails to finish and then that was the end of the race. And that's, we broke right before we went into one of the last, you know, a couple rock trails and we had the smarts just to stop before we got into it because we had zero reverse and we only had one gear and it was, we just knew we were just, we weren't going to, we weren't going to win. It was just going to be, we're out there till midnight until somebody tried to get us out of there i think we were st we still had to go up spooners and outer limits and do those two trails and yeah no and that wasn't going to happen not not two wheel drive no no or not not with not as i said two wheel drive not with third uh third gear only so man adam thank you for so much for coming on did we cover everything that you wanted to cover I want to talk about Texas. You want to talk about Texas. All right. Yeah. You want to talk about Texas? Absolutely. I've, I've lived here since 2001. I'm a Kansas guy, so I'm, I haven't lived here quite half my life, but I'm getting close. I feel like I'm qualified to talk about the state of Texas. I tell you what, every time we are at a race and we've been gone either for two weeks out of KOH or over the long weekend at a, at, you know, out of state race. But there's something about it when you cross that state line and you see that big welcome to Texas sign that just makes you feel good. And it, it should say 
Welcome home back to Texas is what it should say. I love it. Yeah, no, I'm with you. Yeah. We, yeah. I, I think I've talked with you in this uh, about this in the past is when we're coming back from KOH, at least to my address, when I hit El Paso, like I'm not even halfway home. That's what's sad. I'm leaving California, Los Angeles, the city of Los Angeles that's out there on the coast, the West Coast is closer to El Paso than El Paso is to my house. Yep. And I'm in the same, st- I'm in the same state. Yeah, it's big. Texas is big. Everything's big in Texas to steal it from Adam Woodley. It's that damn big. It's that damn big. What people don't see here is talked about Adam's old shop, the the old tribe shop that was just east of downtown. And the first couple of times I went in there, I realized everyone in the shop was was packing. Everybody was carrying, uh, you know, everybody's carrying iron. And here we go on tonight. We're sitting here. Adam sits down. We fire the Skype up. We we start discussing. He pulls out his his uh, concealed carry out of his hip and uh, slaps it up there on the desk. He's got. I'm sitting there looking at his Glock. What was it a Glock? Glock 23. 40 or 40. It's a 40. I love Glocks and that's actually what I have predominantly in, in my, my, uh, my gun safe or what I carry in the numbers, the numbering system. Glock needs to get it together. I think they just need to, for me, they just need to start over. Like it needs to match caliber or something. Cause a Glock 23 seems like it's small, but it's a 40 cal. I mean, that's a, that's a knockdown. That's a knockdown round. Definitely. I stick with the Glock nine millimeters. I don't have anything that's Glock. That's not a nine millimeter though. Mm-hmm. Seems like you can always find nine millimeter ammunition, but yeah, I mean, that's something that we have here that everybody carries carry every day. What else you want to talk to about Texas? I like, you know what? I'm a total geek for Texas history. I totally love the historical markers they have throughout Texas. And I, any chance I get traveling around, I always try to, to stop. Or if I can't, I've got the app on my phone where you can go and you can read about it and what it is and the importance that kind of went on in that area. And it could be in the middle out of you know nowhere out in West Texas or out in the country and just be this lonely historical sign. It's always intrigued me on you know, what happened there in the, in the back in the day. And so I, I, I geek out on that stuff. I love it, man. So bringing that up. So this past 4th of July, my family and I, we did a little, uh, a little tour, a little loop of Texas. So we left, left Houston. We drove up through college station, which college station is home of the uh, Texas A&M. It's also home to, uh, the George Bush presidential library. So we went through, uh, the presidential library. And then from there we headed on up to Waco, toured Baylor campus, saw the bears that they've got, they've got live bears on their campus and then uh, went to the Magnolia silos, found out that was something of a tourist trap. Uh, it wasn't all it was cracked up to be, but we did stay in Waco, ha- you know, had you know some beers and some dinner. But the next day we got up and we drove up to Dinosaur State Park. Have you been there? Yep. Yeah. We've taken our kids there when they were young. Oh man. And my kids are swimming in the river. It's amazing river swimming, but you're swimming in dinosaur footprints that are however many hundred, hundred million, 50 million years old, 63 million years old, something like that. When dinosaurs left footprints in the river bottom and then my kids are swimming in the footprints and loving it. I mean, absolutely loving it. And then, uh, we loaded up from there and went over to Dublin. And if anyone knows about Dublin, I'm going to tell you about Dublin right now. That's the home of Dr. Pepper for ever and ever and ever. That's where you got pure cane, Dr. Pepper. And then there was finally some lawsuit and the Dr. Pepper company actually got to keep the recipe and they can no longer sell the Dublin Dr. Peppers, even though they're referred to as still as Dublin Dr. Peppers by the public. Anyway, Dublin Bottle Works, love that place. And then we circulated down through, was it Driftwood? It was it's Dripping Springs, but really badass barbecue place, the Salt Lake. That's in, uh, that's in Dripping Springs, right? Have you guys, have you been there though? Have you been to Salt Lake? Never have. Okay, so next time we're in Austin together, we're gonna make it a, a, a deal. We're gonna go over there. We're gonna go. We're gonna go down. We're gonna go see Jesse James. Go hang out at his shop. He's gonna teach us how to uh, to blacksmith. We're gonna shoot some guns with him, and then we're gonna go over there to uh, you know barbecue. Jesse, we're inviting ourselves, and we'll talk nice. about it at the Tribe Fire Pit at KOH. And I hope you're bringing your 57, Jesse. You better be bringing the 57 because I want to hang out with you and Jerry, and we're gonna talk about how we're gonna come visit you guys and go eat. Salt Lake barbecue. All right. You got that? <laughs> that that's definitely. Happened. Oh man. Put it on the schedule. Yeah. There's so much, there, there is so much to do in the state of Texas and I'm, I'm gosh, you know, I'm, I'm very blessed to, to live here. I wasn't, I wasn't born here, but I got here as soon as possible is what I say. The hill country is beautiful, you know, floating the Guadalupe river is something you got to do. Uh, the Wheeling down in central Texas is amazing. There's a handful of parks down there that are awesome. Big pink granite rock formations. That's, that's just really amazing to be on. 
Yeah, that part of the world around Katimpsi and Mason and Brady. Oh, yeah. Fredericksburg. Yeah, I mean, that Fredericksburg is a great place for, you know, to send the wives for weekends, weekends of whining, shopping. Good German. Good German food down there, too. Oh, very good German food. The same with New, New Braunfels. You know, you, you did, you brought up the Guadalupe, and that's something that we did on that trip. Uh, we float the river probably two or three times a year. I would like to go the Frio a little bit more often, but we hit the Guadalupe there and then eat, you know, eat there in green, you know, at Green Hall or, or any of the restaurants around there, like the Grist Mill. Anyone that's familiar with Texas in that part of the world, and if you're not and you want to come to Texas and you want to go there, hit me up. I will meet you and my family will meet you because we love that part of the world. Yeah, floating the river. Oh God, it doesn't get any better than that. It's August, it's 103 degrees and that water's 55 coming out of uh, Canyon Lake and every Everybody's got a cooler and a boom box and you're, it's a big floating party. <laughs> that's, that's part, that's a good part of Texas right there. That's, you, I mean, oh man, it's, it doesn't, I get don't know better. where, I don't know if any other state does something like that. I mean, that's just, that's a Texas thing. No, they don't do it anywhere. Uh, you know, where I grew up in Kansas, when you talk about float trip, it's uh, canoes. You go into Missouri and you, you, you do, you canoe and you're, you just cook. Right, you're in an aluminum canoe and it's just reflecting on you and you burn. That's all I remember of float trips was always being sunburned. And then you get to Texas and uh yeah, so floating the rivers. Well, we roll into the it's a little uh tube rental place called the Little Ponderosa, run you up the river. It's about a two and a half hour float, the section that we'd like to do. It's good to take your kids on. It's not one of the party sections. Don't get me wrong. I think there's time and place for the party section. I like that. So like you, me, Clarissa, my wife, we would do the party section. But if we brought, you know, our kids, we would do the the other section where it's a little bit more low key. Speaking of parties, we're going to do Jeep Beach again. Absolutely. Go topless down on Boulevard Peninsula. And you know who we need to get on is the Pellegrinos. I don't, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I'll send them a direct invitation. Yeah. Do you think that's going to happen next year? I don't know. You know, they, uh, there's always hoopla every year on it, but I, I don't, I haven't heard anything since, you know, it's, you know, you always, it's like kicking the anthill, you know, right after the event and, and then it just slowly dies down. I, they can't, I don't think they can control it. I mean, I think they can't like not make it happen. And so what Adam and I are talking about is a uh, Jeep beach on, uh, it's called Jeep beach, go topless. It's happens on Boulevard Peninsula, which is the spit of sand to the east of Galveston Island. So as you go east, you end up on a peninsula. There's a ferry that goes between Galveston Island and uh, Boulevard, which has Crystal Beach. Crystal Beach. Man, what is it? It's probably 25 miles long and easily 12 of it just get filled full of people partying and ripping it on the beach. And that weekend in particular is Jeepers and off-roaders. And, but I mean, you see everything. We, th- this year, there's, there, was a, there was a big group came riding by on horses. Texas, there, I mean, there's, you can't beat that out of that's right. So much fun stuff to do here. I think we're dragging it on. I think we've drug on for too long. I think the the, the other 49 states are uh, going, these guys suck. Right. <laughs> yeah. Through Texas. You definitely you definitely have to edit some of that out. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Well, hey, Adam, thank you again for coming on. Thank you for being a good friend. Thank you for seeing uh, what you see in the talent tank and uh, sharing your world. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you so much for having having me on. Good thing, man. Well, hey, I won't see you in person again until the hammers. I look forward to it, and I look forward to hanging out at uh, the Tribe 16 fire pit down by the main stage. I'm pretty pumped about that. Yeah, Team Texas is where it's at, man. You guys have such a – I would not say I'm a member of Team Texas because I live in South Texas, but your crew and what and your friends and partners and guys that you've worked with or worked for you, man, you guys just have a, you know, a next-level kind of get-together. You guys are almost like a, almost like a gang like I, you know, like sons of anarchy level gang, but, uh, you guys aren't into running drugs or your guns, but no, you guys are tight. You guys are really tight. I really like that and really envy that about you guys. And thanks for letting me uh, hang out with you when we do, but man, look forward to seeing you in February. Good luck yeah, to you it. and Matt in the 4510. Thanks for coming Thank on. Thank you so much. All right, Adam, we'll catch you later. Appreciate it. Wyatt. You made it another episode consumed. If you like the listen, Please go give the show a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts and consider writing a quick review either there or over on the Facebook page. Thank you for tuning in to this wild dive into the talent tank. Wyatt, out. Thank you for listening and taking a dive into the talent tank. Please like and subscribe on Instagram at the talent tank or our website, thetalenttank.com.